Hey there, this is Damien Blinkinsop with another episode of The Quantified Body. This show is about quantifying aspects of our body, our biology, so that we can make better decisions and we can improve our health, performance, and longevity. What we focus on here is a bit like a subset, a smaller part of a much larger movement that's taking place right now. That movement is the quantified self, which you probably have heard of if you're listening to this show. Quantified self is all about self-knowledge through self-tracking with technology. And it covers all sorts of areas way beyond biology in your body to what's going on in your life, what's going on with your time, and pretty much anything you could track related to your life. Quantified Self originated in San Francisco in 2007 with Wired Magazine's editors Kevin Kelly and Gary Wolf. Since then, it's grown tremendously. It's now got 90 groups around the world that meet up regularly and conferences and all sorts of things going on and many, many technology companies working around it. In fact, a lot of the devices we talk about on this show have in some way been supported by this movement. And for sure, some of the cutting edge users and the first users of most of these devices and tools are quantified selfers, the people who move in this community. Today, we have from the Quantified Self Program Director, Ernesto Ramirez. He's behind a lot of the organization of QS Labs, which helps to support and run the community and nurture it. And this is also a research associate at the Center for Wireless and Population Health Systems, part of the University of California at San Diego. And he, he did his PhD there in health behavior. So he's been invested in the quantified self movement and things related to it for quite a while now, as well as a lot of the subjects we look at ourselves here at the quantified body. So it's fantastic to have him on the show to talk about quantified self, where it's going and what they're up to, and also about the best practices surrounding quantifying aspects of our biology, as well as other activities. You can get the full show notes with links to everything we cover today, including the guest, the biomarkers, the labs, and all the usual stuff, as well as a transcript and MP3 download of the show. Just go to thequantifiedbody.net forward slash episodes, and you'll find this episode listed along with all of the others. The Quantified Body. New technologies are bringing us more and better data on our bodies every day. This data promises to help us make better decisions for better health, higher performance, less disease, and greater longevity. In the quantified body, we explore this promise to find out where it is creating real world results, improving bodies, and improving lives. And so, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Glad to be here. Great. Well, I wanted to jump straight into it. You're from the quantified self. Welcome, quantified self, to the quantified body. You guys have pretty much started this. When did you start the quantified movement? When, when did QS come about? Sure. So uh, Quantified Self came about out of a collaboration between Gary Wolf and Kevin Kelly. Um, both had been working at Wired Magazine for quite a long time. And in about 2000 and late 2007, early 2008, they were looking at what was what was kind of the new things? Obviously, personal computing had come about. Like the the reason Wired was started was has already like had been here. You know, now at that point, people were walking around with iPhones, and they realized that computing was getting a lot closer to individuals' bodies. People were able to now use computing in ways to ask very personal questions about themselves. So they started a meetup, um, and uh, people came in and started talking about how they're tracking different things about their lives. And we've kind of just been rolling ever since. That's great, right? I think a lot of people have heard of Gary and, and Kevin, but could you give like a quick background on why these two people came together at that time? You know, what were their backgrounds to kind of start all of this? Yeah, so uh, Kevin Kelly was one of the founding editors of Wired Magazine, but he was also, he's been involved in lots of different projects around how people use different tools objects and technologies. Um, he's been a thinker on technology for quite a long time. You know, he was around with Stuart Brand and the whole Earth catalog and, you know, then transitioned into Wired magazine. Um, Gary was a, is a journalist focusing primarily on technology. And so they were, they both kind of just like used their mutual interests to brainstorm on, on what was next, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's what they came up with was uh, Quantified Self, QS. Yeah, that's great. And of course, QS is pretty much all over the world now, and we can talk a little bit about that um, as, as we go on and how people can participate. But back there in the first meeting, I think you had like eight people or, you know, it was a very small meeting. I think Tim Ferriss was one of the guys who turned up to the first meetings. How, did you, you know who, how many people were turned up to that first meeting? I think they said somewhere around 25 or 30. That was right. before my time. Yeah. You know, I only got involved in about 2010. Right. Um, but 
it was a really interesting meeting because they didn't really have an agenda. It, it doesn't. It didn't look at all like what it looks like mm. now. And then they didn't really know what was going to happen. They thought, hey, okay, people that are interested in this stuff will kind of just come and talk to us, and we'll just have like a chat. Yeah. And then someone came in late, and because they came in late, Kevin Kelly was just said, you know, you have to talk first. You have to tell us about what you're doing, why you're here, what you're interested in. And that gentleman just opened up his computer and said. I've been tracking every day of my life for like the past three years in 15 minute increments. Wow. And that just like blew everyone away. And, and from there, we've kind of built on top of that uh, mentality where people come and actually show the things that they're doing in their own lives. You know, the tools they're using, what they're learning from self tracking, and, and how they're experiencing this new idea of quantified self. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's give people an idea of what's going on at the moment. Like, so basically, there are groups all around the world meeting in different cities all around the world and how is a meeting structure what goes on in a meeting yeah so right now we have about 110 groups in a little over 30 countries around the world and all of them have a little bit different structure we don't we don't kind of force anything on them they're all like volunteer groups uh, that are meeting and but what we try and do is have people come together to share their own personal stories so rather than people standing up and talking about, oh, you should do this thing it's, or you should use this tool, it's very much a first-person narrative where an individual will come in and say, this is the thing that I've done. I've used this tool or this system or this application in this new and interesting way. And these are the thir- things I'm learning about myself. And that spans like all different types of self-tracking technologies and experimentations and projects all the way from, you know, we've had a lot of individuals with chronic diseases, people with type 1 diabetes saying, this is what I'm learning from tracking my blood glucose and my diet in this really interesting way. Or this is what I'm learning from tracking the dates I go on to my pets, to all sorts of different stuff. I think that's one of the things that strikes you when you go to a quantified meeting. Here at the quantified body, we tend to focus on health, longevity, things about the body, which can be related a bit to medical or performance or or longevity, these kind of things. But, you know, quantified self is a lot broader. You can go to a meeting and you can hear, like you said, about someone's dating life and how they've managed to track that over time and, and quantify it in whatever way. So I think the big difference people should get the idea of here is that it's absolutely quantifying any aspect of your life that is interesting to you. And for that reason, when you go to a meeting, you know, you really don't know what is going to come up. And I think the conference really displays that quite well because you have many, many uh, what what we call show and tells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you could uh, explain to people a little bit about what a show and tell is. Sure. It's it's where we, we have those individuals come and actually talk about what they're doing. We call it a show and tell because it's, you know, it's very much like kindergarten. You get up in front of the room and Mm. And you say, like, this is what I've done. This is what I'm bringing to, to everyone. Yeah. And we ask the presenters to really answer three simple questions, which is, what did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? And all the time, keeping that kind of first-person narrative perspective, where it's really about their experiences, the, the visualizations they made, the data analysis they've done, the process they've done to gather data, and what conclusions they've come up with through that entire data-gathering experience. And if you think about it, one of the fun things is that those three questions, what did you do? How did you do it? What did you learn? Are really a simple, simple way to think about the scientific method. The scientific method has a little bit more broader, but if you bring it really, if you kind of just simplify that and bring it down to the individual level, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Another term we often come across today is N equals one experiments. We, we just said that a lot of people are also doing kind of N equals one experiments because there's, there's basically the there's tracking, just recording. And then there's like, I'm going to change something and see what happens. So are those both of those things covered in QS naturally or how does that work? Oh, totally. So you have a lot of people engaging with self-tracking, you know, the, the broad spectrum of things that could be called self-tracking for a variety of different reasons. One you mentioned, um, a few of them you did mention. You know, one is just kind of data gathering, just for the purpose of data gathering. You know, a lot of people wear smart pedometers like a Fitbit or a Jawbone Up or a Nike Fuel Band without any real purpose, other than like they want to just understand and keep track of this data. And then there's the individuals like you're saying that do these kind of n of one experiments. And even within those experiments, there's a huge range of kind of how meticulous and detailed people get. 
Some people just say, you know what, I want to see if going on a more plant-based diet is going to reduce my weight and improve my blood cholesterol levels. And they'll just kind of track the things they're eating. They'll track their weight. They might do a blood test or something. And there's other people that are just like super meticulous about setting up a very programmed experimentation or experimental protocol. And there's, uh, and those are also always a lot of fun to watch to see people get very scientific about the things that they care about. Right. I've seen many of these things where it's actually made a huge impact on people's lives, right? That's some of the astounding things. I remember the first one I went to in London, and there was a presentation from a guy who'd suffered from depression for most of his life. And he simply set up a way of quantifying and communicating that to all of his friends. So I think there's sometimes a social aspect. You can talk potentially more, uh, a lot more about this than me. And simply by doing that, he found that his rate of depression dropped and he was basically happier every day just through this exercise of tracking and letting all of his friends see how depressed or how not depressed he was. Obviously, like that completely revolutioned his life because he, he didn't feel depressed most of the time anymore. So I've seen some, you know, huge changes and weight losses is, is very obvious. What are the, some of the most exciting changes you've seen people get out from the quantified self? Yeah, so there's, there's a bunch. One of my favorites, uh, there's a gentleman in New York. He's given a talk. Um, a few times actually in New York and uh, at their meetup. And I think he also gave a talk at our last conference in uh, 2013, our last uh, US-based conference. And his name is Doug Cantor. He's a type 1 diabetic. He's been on a um, insulin pump for quite a long time and now is on a continuous glucose measurement system. So rather than doing like the finger prick, you know, he has a implanted device that can continually measure his blood glucose. And as part of one of his graduate design projects in New York, he developed a system to gather all of that data. So he was gathering his insulin, his blood glucose, and then also his meals and his uh, physical activity. He was primarily a runner. And he gave, tells this really interesting story about bringing all of that data in and being able to see all of this information and kind of how it all connects led it to the healthiest year of his life when you look at it from a diabetic perspective. So, you know, that's um, A1C, which is their primary measure. So which is how, how well they can metabolize um, blood glucose. And he, it really tells us like interesting thing, plus his visualizations, that's primarily what he was doing in graduate school was um, working on design are just astounding. You can definitely see like what happens to him over the course of a year through his his wonderful visualizations. Which, if your listeners want to uh, look online, I believe his website is called Data Beaties. I mean, that's a really interesting one. And then, I mean, we've seen a bunch, like you were saying, uh, the gentleman that was tracking his mood. That seems to be a really, really interesting one as well. Um, one of the most interesting and fun ones that you wouldn't think would be in quantified self, but is, is uh, there's an individual who actually works, does some work with us, but lives in Portland named Stephen Jonas. And he's really interested in memory and being able to remember things. And he uses a system called spaced repetition and a program called super memo. And he's given uh, two talks recently about how he's using space repetition to try and remember every day of his life. Wow. So he's every day he creates a card. Basically, these are like intelligent flashcards that say like these are the th like these are the important things that happened today, and then quizzes himself to see if he can remember what days those were. That's really interesting. I mean, that's something very unique as well. I think that's the amazing thing about QS. No matter what you're interested in, you can go there, and you can get feedback from other people to potentially improve what you're doing. Um, like because with these show and tells, there's there's a lot of questions, of course, because it come from the audience once you've finished your show and tell. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, and what's one of the interesting things, like a lot of people would say, you would think that we would focus like just on health or just on, you know, weight loss and physical activity, since those are like the primary things that people do when they engage with these self-tracking tools and applications and devices. But what we found is that when people go up and talk about their super personal experiences, whether it's uh, individual tracking his, we had one in San Francisco, tracking his blood coagulation levels, because he is on um, blood thinners or it's someone talking about how they track their heart rate variability because they want to understand their stress. Even though you might be interested in that particular topic, the process that they go through and the things that they do might inspire you to try something in your own life around the ideas that you're interested in. Like, who knows, you know, tracking 
how much you drive your car. <laughs> Yeah, because I think there's this whole, I mean, there's this scientific relevance in terms of how you're tracking, is it controlled and things. And, and you know, I found because I led the Bangkok QS session, most like the questions that come out, it's about the quality of the data, if, if we can trust it, you know, these kinds of things come up. And if you're doing an experiment, if, is it well controlled? You know, can we believe in the results? These kinds of questions often come up and it helps us to, and of course, this can apply to anything that you're tracking. It's obviously a lot of the time, it's the same kinds of questions to see, okay, how useful is this data? And and also, I found that people often share their own experiences from that kind of aspect of their life, and, and they get new ideas. So uh, one time we had um, uh, one of my friends, he has a website called agentefficiency.com, and he, he tracks all of his time, all of his time he puts it into categories, no matter what he's doing. When he's sleeping, it's categorized as sleeping. And he's done this experiment for, I think it was about a year. So he brought you know, all his data, which basically showed what he'd been doing with his life for about a year. And it was really interesting for a lot of people because like, oh, that's interesting. How much time you spend preparing meals or how much time you spend walking or commuting. Um, and it can be quite shocking to some people and they start to think about, well, maybe I'm spending too much time commuting in my life and stuff. So I found that a really interesting one. And, and obviously everyone had something to say about that. And for most of the show and tells, I would say it is things that relate to anyone and they'll, and you'll go and you'll, and, and these are aspects of your life maybe you don't look so closely at, but most of the time it's something you can relate to and learn from yourself as well also. Yeah. And I mean, and a lot of these times, like what you're describing here with this individual that tracks time, which is also a super very, very popular um, topic. It's really interesting to kind of see how people actually engage with their time tracking in different ways, whether they just let their machines track their time for them or they, they do it all themselves and set up, you know, really fancy Excel spreadsheets to do it. What is interesting is that a lot of times when someone gets up and says, I am doing this thing, there's a lot of times that people will say, you know what, I was interested in that too, or I've always been thinking about it. Like you imagine, like you were saying, oh, I was always wondering how much time I spend commuting. This is someone who's actually done something, and now I can take this lesson. Like if I want to apply that in my own life, I can take their lessons that they're learning and try and do that in my own life or reformat it into a different way that might work for me. Right, right. Well, I can tell you, like once I'd seen my friend's data, I was inspired to track my my life for three months every hour, and I got a lot out of it as a, as a consequence. So, so I think what we're touching on here is QS helps motivate, inspire people. Um, the fact that people can get together and talk about quantification. So for someone who who perhaps they'd like to do experiments on their life, they'd like to potentially improve a part of their life, which they've been having trouble with before, or maybe they're just interested in understanding something better. I think QS is a great place to go to because there'll be other people and it kind of provides you this motivation, this support network following through with that. Whereas, you know, most people maybe find it harder to get started. And there's a lot of people who know a lot about a lot about the devices. And, and there's a lot of people generally in those groups who know a lot about the kind of devices that are out there. And so it's a great group also to swap ideas on things. Oh, yeah. I mean, the number of individuals uh, around the world that engage with their own quantified self meetups, they organize them or they come to our conferences or they just engage with us on our, our forum on our website is, is astounding. And the amount of help that people get and people are asking questions all the time. What device can I use to track this thing? Or I've been thinking about doing this. Or my physician said I should try tracking this to, to help me with you know this condition or that condition is amazing. And it's always great to see. It's one of the reasons we love doing this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Another thing I wanted to really touch on is where have you seen the movement uh, come from and, and where is it today in, in terms of making progress? What have we learned so far about tracking data on ourselves from QS? What are the kind of biggest achievements being to date? Is there anything that you've changed about the way you're doing QS uh, to help people get more out of it, uh, get more out of tracking in general? Well, I think one of the things that we're learning is that people definitely want to engage with their data. And that's not always easy. And so one of the things that we've been doing in one of our core pieces of our current work and future work over the next few years is going to be really tackling this issue of data access. So if you use a device or an application that you're contributing data to, so it's tracking your physical activity or your location or doing something that where you're contributing pieces of information that are about you. This happens a lot in the medical setting. You know, you are like that individual who has to wear a um, glucose meter. They are contributing their own personal data. 
And in many cases, getting that data out, controlling it, being able to access it, even in some cases having ownership of it, is tricky. And it's not a very clear like consensus across the board, whether or not people should have ownership, whether they should have control, whether they should have access. All of these are like three different concepts that kind of always get talked about in each other or around each other. And that's one of the things that we're really focused on is improving the amount of access that people have from their data. Right now, we're really early on, uh, but it's something that we're really, really passionate about. Because one of the things that we've seen like through a lot of these show and tells and through our conferences is that when people actually get access to their data, they can export their data, put it into a CSV spreadsheet, you know, use an API connection to plug it into a different tool, they can do astounding things with it. They can learn really, really important stuff, whether it's just through a visualization or some kind of analytics tool. So that's one of the things that we're, we're definitely seeing. The other is, I think, I mean, just kind of piggybacking on that one is the role of data visualization and storytelling in this. Visualizations I don't always have to be super scientific and I think they can tell a really, really interesting story around people's data. The issue is, is like it's kind of hard to make them, you know, unless you're really, really good at Excel or you're good, uh, you're a decent software developer that can handle JavaScript or Python. It's hard to really make compelling visualizations that tell the stories that you want to tell or can help you understand your data in that new and different way. So that's something we're keeping an eye out for. That's interesting because I think the first one you talk about access, it's also kind of like knocking its head with privacy. If we look at the world to date, information has been pretty private. If we look at medical information, for instance, it's tucked in some doctor's drawer and uh, even the patient doesn't realize he can have access to that you know, information a lot and even take it home. So there's kind of the health area. And I think also like, like financials and you know, all, all these other dis- different aspects of our lives. And it is an interesting topic. How much do we want other people to have access to it? How easy is it to get access to our own information? And I think obviously the first one is like, it would be nice if everyone had ownership of their own information to start with and be able to decide what privacy limitations are on that. In an ideal future world, is this some of the topics you're struggling with and looking at? Definitely. So across the board, you know, we're really interested in, I mean, privacy, data access and data ownership, they're all they're all kind of like prongs in this really big conversation, which is what is the role of personal data in our lives and what should we be able to do with it? So all the way from, you see, there's a lot of work now in, like you were saying, the health record space. Like, should you have access to the health records? Like if you get a lab test at your physician's office, should you have immediate access to that information? What does that mean? There's some actually, there's some really interesting programs going on in the United States where if you go to see a, a physician, when you're talking to them, you're having a conversation, they're writing on their laptop or their desktop computer, they're writing notes in your file. Should you be able to read those notes? For a long time, that was, those were just kind of in your medical record and you never got to see them unless you specifically asked for them. And then in some cases, you have to pay for that access and lots of weird stuff. But now there's projects like opening those up so people could have conversations about those notes, which are a piece of data about that interaction. And then there's a lot of information around like data privacy as well. So should a company like say you're wearing a Fitbit, should Fitbit be able to make aggregated charts and graphs about your physical activity um, to share with kind of like readers of their Fitbit blog? You know, maybe not your specific, but a group of people. And what does that mean? Is that is that going against data privacy or not? And there's a lot of unanswered questions. And I don't think there's a lot of, there's not going to be any definitive answer. I don't think anyone's going to just say like, okay, we're going to turn the key now. And now everyone has complete ownership over their own data. And they have to authorize every single person in the room, whoever wants to t- look at something. Nothing so far has really shown that that's going to occur because data has some inherent value <laughs> for a lot of these companies that you're engaging with. But there are really interesting conversations around like what does it mean and who who actually should be work, able to work with this data and how easy should it be for the individuals that create it to use it and have access to it so they can do whatever they'd like. Yeah. 
these questions definitely need to be tackled, like you say, it's kind of like up in the air. Um, there's a lot more self-testing in the health area being made available to us now, mm -hmm. increasingly over time. Um, but of course, that's kind of knocking heads with regulation and physicians, how comfortable they feel with that based on the complexity of tests, if people can understand them and interpret them properly. You know, there's, there's lots and lots of questions in the health area about that. I don't think it's going to get resolved anytime soon. But in the meantime, it seems like access to testing is steadily coming online anyway whether we're ready for it or not from that perspective. So it'll be interesting, I guess, like QS is going to be tackling those issues. Because, I mean, it, what happens in QS is like whatever's going on tends to come up and, and be talked about in QS since it's basically the home of everything that's being discussed in quantification at the moment, right? Yeah, and, you know, this is something interesting. Someone, we're hosting a another, uh, what we call our global conference, the, the large conference in the United States in June yeah. of next year. Which city is that in, just for people... So, yeah, so in 2015, we're hosting the Quantified Self Global Conference, which we call QS15. It's actually going to be a three-day conference. It's a conference and expo. Um, yeah, I can talk about it a little bit if you want. We can talk about our overall program. It's in San Francisco, right? In San Francisco, yep. correct. Yep, yep. So someone was talking about this idea of privacy and ownership, uh, specifically around home testing, so, you know, in the United States, we have the FDA, which has to approve medical tests. And there's a big push from a lot of companies in the startup space that are saying, like, we can have people do medical testing at home. So all the way from testing your blood for vitamin D levels to testing urinary fluid to, to see about to check blood glucose and other, and other different things. And this big push because people want to be able to do this stuff on their own. Just in the same way that people wanted to measure their blood pressure at home a long time ago, they realized that just getting your blood pressure measured, you know, twice a year in the doctor's office doesn't really give you a good look at what blood pressure is for you. The same way, you know, that getting your blood tested once a year or once every few years if there's only an issue it doesn't really tell you the whole story. And so there's still like there's a big push right now, and we're closely following it because obviously that's good that's a whole new area of some for way for for people to learn about their lives being able to actually gather data that is heretofore has been just kind of siloed in the medical establishment and bringing that to the individuals mm -hmm. but if we open that there's i mean there's a huge potential in terms of a big problem doctors have today is compliance uh with whatever protocol or, or treatment they've applied to people but, you know, a feedback system, feedback is incredibly valuable. If you tell someone that, we'll look at glucose management, right? So if you tell them that, like, currently their glucose, their fasting glucose in the morning is 100 and it really needs down to be down in the low 90s and they have some convenient way of doing that at home, say it's uploaded to a system which is shared with the doctor, if they're given that reading in their face every morning, they're like, uh-oh, I'm not making progress here and I've got my doctor's appointment coming up um, next month. Um, I think there's, a, there's an incredible accountability and motivation aspect from that perspective to be like, okay, I, I got to get back on, on, on this treatment protocol that uh, my doctor gave me last visit. Exactly. You know, there is that, there's the motivational aspect. There's, I mean, the individual's ability to learn about themselves, but there's also the ability to understand, you know, if you really take the medical example as the leading example here, understanding treatment and outcomes at a very personal level. So rather than a doctor saying, hey, go use this thing and then like, use this blood pressure medication for six weeks and then come back to me and then we'll measure your blood pressure again and we'll see how it's working. Rather than waiting that entire time, you can maybe get a faster feedback system. So you could say that this one is really working for me. I've already seen my blood pressure go down. I've been taking it you know, once in the morning, once in the evening by myself in my home using the protocol that you set up, or this one's definitely not working, we need to use a different kind of medication. So rather than just saying, like, here's what works, now we can start to ask, like, what does, what actually works for me as an individual? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's many, many devices, as you've alluded to, there are startups, there's a lot of investment in this area right now in terms of startups, uh, where it come to health testing, um, fitness tracking, all sorts of aspects of this, and, and social media, kind of like uh, sharing of data, and these kind of things and aggregating data. So in terms of the state of devices available today, are there any challenges faced with people using these and getting the value from these? Because I've bought many tracking devices and I have to say so far, I think the main complaint is that people don't find that a lot of the data is very actionable when it comes down to it. And I think sometimes it comes down to, there's the other concern of accuracy 
and many of the devices it's kind of nascent um if you look at for instance uh, a lot of the the watches the fitness trackers and all of these kind of things which are tracking in a very convenient way because you're just wearing this piece of technology which is going to quantify different aspects of your movement and, and things going on each day but when like some of the studies i've seen where people have compared these devices with each other well they don't really measure up to each other right um they got different results and so there's a concern of accuracy there which has come up but it's also so i mean i think that leads into the actionability also of like what we're doing and also like the selection of measures and what the device companies are doing so i just were interested in your perspective on what's going on out there and what are the biggest challenges to reinforce that movement and if we we're going to see an explosion of devices over the next years because they did become so valuable to our lives what would need to change yeah i think regardless of whether we want it or not we are going to see an explosion of devices <laughs> just because, <laughs> investments there <laughs> yeah there's a, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of money there that people are kind of pouring into the system. Sensors are becoming cheaper. Battery life is improving. Like the, the technical capacity of computing to track things and make sense of objects and behaviors and information is, is improving. I mean, that's just kind of the state of technology as a whole. It's just kind of on this upward trends and it's always improving. And data science is getting better. Algorithms are getting better. I think the, one of the issues around kind of this accuracy idea is, in some cases, the over-promising of what a device can do and what it can understand, an individual's kind of what they really actually need. So I always like to have like, the more philosophical conversation around like accuracy versus truth and what that actually means for an individual. Like, does your Fitbit or Jawbone Up need to know down to the exact number of steps like, does it matter if it says 10,412 versus 10,512? And also, this is a relative thing. If it's, if it's yeah. wrong the same amount every day, well, you can still use it for motivation and, and like a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, if you have systematic error or random error, it really kind of it matters. But, you know, in most cases, a lot of this stuff is just kind of systematic bias. It's always going to be wrong at this certain level. But, you know, if your scale is always wrong five, at five pounds heavy in the morning, it doesn't really matter as long as you use the same scale. But... In some cases, the, the, like a lot of the issue, though, around this accuracy is tied to the medical system because a lot of people want to push the data that they're collecting into some sort of health record or have it coordinated with their care so that people can understand this data in relation to their health outcomes. And so now there's a bigger push to take the data from these devices, figure out what if they are accurate, to and then put them in kind of a clinical model into so they can be uh, looked at in the health records. And I think that's something that is coming quickly. I mean, we're already seeing that happen with, you know, Apple made a big push for this in with HealthKit. So they took devices and they took data formats and they said, okay, these are the exact formats that we can use. And now they're being pushed into electronic medical records, I think at like Duke Hospital and, and a few other different uh, hospital systems. Wow, wow. For people, could you yeah. talk a, bit, a little bit about that? It's basically Apple has done some work to standardize a number of measures yeah. that they're going to be... Rather than yeah. saying, like, we trust you as a device maker. So there's, let's say there's like seven different digital scales that are out there. Rather than saying, like, these are the four that we think are accurate. They're saying, if you want to integrate with our HealthKit system, you have to report this data format, this data feature, which is weight in a specific way that, that we know we, is like clinically understandable. So if you're going to say like what blood glucose is, it has to be in, I think it's um, millimoles. So you have to report it in these specific data formats so that it can be understandable at a clinical level. The accuracy part is kind of it's left up to the people that take in that data. Because one of the things like, this is kind of a more technical <laughs> Um, conversation around how HealthKit works, but basically someone who says, like, I want to look at, say a doctor says they want to look at my HealthKit data and they want to look at the amount of um, miles I run each week. And if I connect like three different running apps, they can say, well, I trust RunKeeper, but not Strava. So I only will take runs that are reported with RunKeeper for whatever reason. That's a completely arbitrary example. Both I think are fine apps. <laughs> So that is something that, that is definitely coming on board, which is, I mean, it it's kind of relates to what our conversation earlier, which is this kind of personalized medical testing, is that there's a lot of push to get the entire breadth of 
someone's life, their behaviors that they do outside of a clinical or medical setting, and bring that understanding into the medical field so that people can create better care plans. They can understand cause and effect at a better level. And it's still very nascent. You know, this is still very early on. There's entire work on this, which is people that are wanting to say like, okay, let's track your, from your genome to your weight, to your diet, to your physical activity. Like if we could bring all of that in, what is it that we could actually learn about humanity and how life actually works out there in reality? Yeah. It sounds like the device manufacturers, the technology companies like Apple and, and co, like Intel has been making acquisitions in this area. They've acquired basis. So, you know, a lot of these companies are now looking at this area. It sounds like they're going to be a tremendous force in where this goes. And even when it comes to the governmental, typically regulated parts like health and so on, they're going to be a tremendous force in where this eventually goes and an influence. Is that what you're seeing at the moment? There's more, seems to be more and more influences that are pushing, trying to push the realm out, basically. I think so. I think there's a lot. It's still a little early on to say, like, these are going to, they're going to start, you know, maybe lobbying the government to do different things. But what we are seeing is that there's actually a, a lot of pressure within governmental organizations and governmental bodies to understand. Everyone calls this stuff different things. We have M Health, we have Connected Health, we have Quantified Self. I mean, all of them kind of relate to each other. And there's a lot of push right now to say, like, this is happening. We can't just say, like, that this stuff isn't around. What can we actually do to make sense of this? So, like, one of the things that we actually did as an organization uh, in collaboration with um, a large funder, a uh, health uh, research funder here in the United States called the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we hosted a meeting last year, I'm sorry, earlier this year, actually, early 2014, where we brought together people in the quantified self that are what we call tool makers, you know, the people that make devices and applications and systems, along with researchers in public health and computer science to say, like, to understand, like, what is the role of this personal data in research? Because now, rather than a researcher saying, I have to develop an entirely new strategy, and I have to buy a bunch of sensors to give to people so I can understand how much activity they get during the week versus the weekend, now there's people, like, they're they're just collecting that data on their own. And what is the role of that information in the research realm, and what can we learn from that? And that's still very, very, very early. But there's a big push, I think, to say, like, why should we pay a million dollar grant for you to develop new sensors or new tools or buy you know, different things when all there's all these people that are actually out there doing it on their own? What can we learn from them? Right. So previously on episode nine of uh, the Quantified Body, we spoke to Jessica Richman of uh, Ubiome, which you know you should know well, and she's approaching this whole thing calling it crowd science. Yeah. Right? Which is basically turning science upside down and using technology and putting the right standards in place and so on we could completely revolutionize uh, the approach through quantification, like of the masses, basically quantified self everywhere could start feeding science, the new ideas and, and so on, and completely revolutionize the way we approach all of that. Exactly. I mean, this idea of crowdsourced science or citizen science is, is super compelling. You know, at this meeting, we were talking with an individual um, named Margaret McKenna, who's on the data science team at Runkeeper. And we were talking just about, um, so in the United States, and I think in 2008, they published kind of what they call the physical activity guidelines, which says adults have to get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a week. But she was talking about when they look at their data, like that's just not true. Like people just don't do that. They're not robots. You know, they don't like every week get exactly this amount. It kind of goes in waves. People come and go. And there were, she was talking like, is there something that we could do as like an organization? Like we are a large data collector. We have like millions and millions of users that are tracking activity to better understand what guidelines should actually be. Or if you look at, say for instance, like, so part of, in part of my world is, you know, I do physical activity research. So that's where all my examples come from. I apologize. But uh, so in the United States, we have what's called the national health and nutrition examination survey. So every few years, they go out and, and kind of try to measure the health of America. And they do it through clinical work, um, through surveys. And they also, to measure physical activity, they give a few thousand people um, accelerometers. And that's what we, how we say, like, okay, people aren't or are getting enough physical activity. And that, if you were to say that's how we measure physical activity in the United States, 
that data set is just completely dwarfed by the amount of data that companies like Garmin and Nike and Fitbit and Chabon have if just in the United States. But then if you think about the worldwide scale, we're now, they're able to like track millions of people. And if we could use that to understand interesting things about human behavior, it really opens up a whole new world of possibilities in, in the research realm. Yeah. It would change completely our approach. I know from business uh, decision-making perspective, like um, internet marketing, for instance, with previous partners, I always used to have discussions and it was opinion-based. And even when I was working in consulting, we'd have opinion-based discussions and whoever argued the best would win. In this new world, the idea is that we're actually able to go and test. And that's what's nice about the internet today with, with people in business. Instead of arguing backwards and forwards and the person who argues the, the most, in that business now they're saying well let's test that idea and and see what happens right um and i think that's what's really exciting especially with people who follow kind of like the, the health realm there's been many kind of assumptions made and killed over time and there's still a ton of conflict in the world of medicine and health for sure and if not more and more so as things there's different you know people find discover new things and so on and i think i don't think that's going to disappear anytime soon because it's kind of like cutting edge bleeding edge science but if we had this site kind of feedback uh, uh mechanism where we could actually do tests and see oh like let's just put it to a test let's let's see what the population tells us about that hypothesis it would revolutionize the speed of, of development um of, of things so yeah or i mean if you think, imagine like one of the things that we're interested in, like what if you put the question asking in the hands of the actual individuals mm. so like jessica's case you know she's looking at microbiome data so rather than saying like okay what are the research questions that are in the field that's in the literature what if individuals came up with those questions what if they like what if someone said you know what i really like my pets. I wonder if being around my dog changes my microbiome, the amount of bacteria that I'm in, in contact with. Like, that's probably a really interesting question. Has it been asked in the literature? Who knows? I mean, someone probably knows, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it brings to surface things people actually care about instead of us assuming this is what matters to humans, what matters to everyone that we kind of resolve and, and put science towards. So in terms of uh, quantified self coming back to more practical, um, what would you say a best tips if someone wants to quantify something about themselves um what would you say are some best practice kind of tips that you think it's good to follow in terms of gathering or, or using the data or whatever that you've seen over time yeah i think simplicity is always best so one of the things that people like they always like okay well i want to know about x y and z about my life and then you know you start building like the mechanism like how can i keep track of this data that i care about and that can get really unwieldy really quickly because there's so many different ways to do it. And we may want to get very, very super specific. And I think the easiest thing to do is like whenever you find the question that you're interested in, where it's like, I'm curious about, or I wonder if this is related to that, or does it try to develop what are the easiest way that you can collect that information and engage with it? And then build a system around that, whether that's going and buying a fitness tracker or a internet connected weight scale or setting up, you know, Google spreadsheets. I think one of the most underrated physical or um, quantified self-tracking systems is Google Forms. It's super easy to do. You can put it on your phone and you can just like let have yourself answer surveys whenever you want. <laughs> right, right. Just answer those two questions every morning. You can have an alert on your iPhone as well. It just says answer your form. Exactly. You know, exactly. It says like race, race, how, race. you know, say you wanted to know about your sleep. You could just say every morning, just click the open that little Google form and says like, how did you sleep? How long did you sleep? What did you do the night before? There's simple things like that. But the other thing is, is you know, you know, it, it does seem a little self-promotional, but on the Quantified Self website, we have a link to these show and tell videos, and there's hundreds of them. You know, we have over 700 videos in our video archive on Vimeo, but you can search the website and probably find something that's related to what you're interested in. So if you're interested in blood glucose, you can type that in and you're going to get returned a bunch of different posts and videos and real people talking about their real experiences tracking that thing. Exactly, and what obstacles they came across and resolved or, or so on. So you can get a head start in rather than like starting from zero and maybe falling into the same traps. Yeah, excellent point. So um, Ernesto, in, what do you see, what's the future of QS? Like you spoke a little bit about like what you guys are focusing on right now, but are there specific things you're looking at at the moment and any kind of challenges you've kind of got your eye on as well of the movement? 
Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to open up and really bring this idea of quantified self to the public and really showcase that these tools and technologies are going to start coming hard and fast. And whatever kind of questions you have, you're going to be able to engage with those questions. Um, And so one of the things that we're doing alongside of our global conference is having this public expo. So we 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 have this really amazing venue in San Francisco right on the water at Fort Mason where we're inviting people um, to just to come and experience all of the different kind of tools and tracking systems to understand what's actually available out there, what are the cool things that you can do, what are the questions you can ask, and how can you engage with your own personal data to through a way of engaging with your own life. Um, so that that's one of our both, I think, one of the things we're really interested in and one of our, our fun challenges for next year. I know part of it is also that data access piece, something we're really interested in, trying to engage the research community with the quantified self community as a whole. Great, great, great. Thank you very much for that. Who besides, I don't know, QS or perhaps specific resources, uh, what would you recommend people look at in in order to learn more about quantifying themselves? Uh, like, are there any specific resources, um, people, or things that people could look at to learn how to do this better and, and so on? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, again, self-promotional here. I'll start with the Quantified Self website, which is just quantifiedself.com. Right. That's and to join, I mean, what's the best approach to get involved? Let's, let, let's talk straight about it. Like, to get involved in QS, what What's the best? I know how I do it, but like, I'd love to hear how, you, how you'd go and get, how would you, what's your first step to get involved with QS? So on the website we have, um, on there's a sidebar, there's a list of all of the different meetups that are quantified self meetups around the world. So one of the first thing you can do is, I mean, obviously in person is going to be a lot more fun than just watching videos at home uh, on your computer. So trying to find a meetup that's close to you is, is step number one. So whether you're in Los Angeles or New York or Boston or St. Louis or like yourself and or um, in Australia, oh gosh, I'm trying to like name all of them now, London. <laughs> all the, <laughs> they're all over the world. They're all over, Singapore. Yeah. Um, you can find a meetup close to you. If though, however, you can't find a meetup, we invite you to just start your own and then publicize it within your own local community to meet other people like you. That's one of the, the, I think, the most interesting and fun parts of this is it is a community. It's a social aspect. We hear all the time when people come to the conferences or come to the meetups, like, I didn't realize there were other people that are interested in the same things I was interested in. You know, I didn't realize there were other dorks, yeah. you know, or geeks that were tracking their lives in Excel right. or using wireless scales and, and really trying to, like, understand themselves through the lens of personal data. Yeah, yeah. And right. we have a how to start your own meetup um, blog post on our page on the website where it details everything, but also you can get a hold of me. Um, um, my, our, my contact information is up on the website as well. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And um, just for people like I, I was living in Bangkok at the time um, where they didn't have a QS, but I did travel a bit. So I, I go to London, come to the US sometimes, and I would just drop in like whenever I'm in a city, I'll see if there's a QS there. So if you travel a bit, you know, you can always like check out, oh, like, do they have any local QSs? And you can either do that on meetup.com or you can go straight to the quantified self. And as you said, you have everything listed there. But I think the thing we didn't say is like that um, every all of the meets for quantified self are managed through meetup.com. So they're all listed in there. Is that correct? That's that's correct. So all of them on are on meetup.com. So you can always search quantified self on meetup um, to find something near you. Yeah. And you can just, you know, RSVP, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and join. And then so I found that helpful personally to see what it was like. You know, I was in some of the early meetings for London and stuff. And then because there was nothing in Bangkok, I, like you said, I was just like, OK, I'll just create my own one. And it was surprising to see that even in Bangkok, Thailand, where you don't exactly think there's going to be a lot of people interested in kind of something that's a bit more cutting edge from Silicon Valley. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of people who joined uh, just naturally through the through the meet. It's very easy to get started, even if there isn't one in your, in your own town. Exactly, and you know, one of the other things you could obviously you could come to one of our two conferences. We put on two a year. I was mentioning our global conference that we called QS fifteen. Uh, it'll be in June in San Francisco, and then we're currently planning our gosh, what would this be? Our fourth European conference in Amsterdam in September of two thousand fifteen. Yeah, and that's a great intro because there's such a variety of different people and things going on there, a great place to network and, and meet people that might be interested in similar things to you too. I'm sure yeah. there's many businesses being grown out of QS, in fact, just through that kind of networking aspect. 
too many to even name. <laughs> there's, I mean, it seems like there's one a day, and that's great because the more the more the ways people can engage with their own personal data, and you know, like we're saying, you know, answer the questions that they find interesting and important, uh, the better for them. Yep. Are there any other resources you found useful in terms of well, whatever, like learning how to gather data better, or you know, track it better, or make better decisions from it, or whatever? So one of the things, I mean, I, because it's part of my job as program director for Quantified Self, is just kind of staying abreast of different news and information. So if you're on Twitter, the, the um, Quantified Self hashtag, which is just all one word, Quantified Self, is pretty great. You know, there's, there's a mix of um, people like news articles, people doing interesting things, but also people talking about their own data um, in, in different visualizations or projects or experiments they've done. Our QS forum is great. People are always posting stuff on there, which is just forum.quantifiedself.com. Then, oh gosh, I just feel like, I, mean, I feel self-promotional just trying to say promote all the things <laughs> you, do, but, you can't think of anything yeah. besides QS. No, well, we, so the other things like, <laughs> Well, I guess you guys are trying to pull in anything that's good, Yeah, right? and so, so every every Saturday I post on our website, it also goes out as a newsletter called What We're Reading. And it's just the links to both self-tracking projects interesting data visualizations, but also just kind of like articles around the culture of data and quantified self and what that means to people are doing interesting stuff. But it's also, I mean, just some just tech news in general. I think the last time I've, this last week, I posted a random article about um, researchers that were able to trick computers into thinking like different images were not what they seemed. It was really interesting Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. algorithms and robotics, but (laughs) <laughs> a little random. Cool. We'll put uh, links to all that stuff in the show notes. Yeah. So, um, Anissa, what would be your number one recommendation uh, to someone trying to use some form of data to make better decisions about their body's health performance? Oh, my number one recommendation. That is, I said it earlier, which is, you know, start small and, and kind of look at the easiest possible way to do it. So don't, try not to overload yourself with devices or systems or tools or applications and the second part is, I think, talk to someone else about your data, whether that's someone online that you know or don't know, um, you know, sharing your data visualization, having a conversation. Because what happens, I think, a lot of times is when individuals sit with their own question and they, they engage with their own data, you already have some sort of bias. Like you're already looking for some kind of interesting pattern in this specific way. And someone else who who doesn't have your own personal experience, I mean, they're obviously not you, is going to bring a new set of eyes and a new set of experiences. And having those conversations with people, I think, can be really, really interesting. A lot of those show and tells that happen in person, a question will be like, have you ever thought about looking at your data in this other way? And a, and a speaker or presenter will say, oh, I really have it. Like, that's an interesting thing to do. I've never thought about that. So I think talking to someone about it and about what you've learned or what you're doing is always a great way to actually learn more. Great, great. And to your first point, it, you're saying like keep it simple because um, because basically, I mean, I know that some people take on these projects they are too complex and they get tired of them because it takes too much effort every day. So convenience, like, is, isn't it like how convenient can you track this? How little effort does it take? Are important considerations when you're saying, oh, I got to track this data for a month or two to get what I want out of it. Um, so not trying to go overboard. I think some projects could be dropped. I guess you might. Have you seen that kind of thing, like where people will start out a bit over ambitious in terms of how much they want to collect and how much time they're spending on it and kind of drop the project halfway through and don't get the value or whatever they wanted out of it? Of course. Yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In all aspects of life. Final question, uh, a bit more about you. What data metrics do you track? For your own body on a routine basis? Yeah, so I've been tracking with um, a Fitbit since 2011. Um, I, I, you know, I, have a, I have a space in there that's uh, where I lost it. So I, I had, I used data from my phone to kind of back up. I use like, I'm a fan of redundant systems. <laughs> yeah. So I have my, my phone's tracking my physical activity. So is my Fitbit. Um, I track my running both with um, a GPS watch and a heart rate monitor and my phone as well. <laughs> Um, I also, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of geolocation because I think it tells a really interesting story about how you move around the world. So I track my geolocation. I've been doing my, my weight, uh, not every morning, but I try and be pretty consistent, um, as well with that. And then my overall productivity and, um, computer use, I use some time tracking software to do that as well. Great. And what has been the biggest insight 
from all of this kind of stuff that you, you've drawn today, the thing you found personally most useful, it could be anything just that you found it personally useful for your life. Oh, so, um, so even like as a physical activity researcher, I found it really useful to have something that tracks my physical activity because it really kind of hit home for me that mm. you really have to make it a priority, at least for my own. Like I really had to make it a priority to, to move, whether that's making sure that I go on walks, I get up from my desk, um, you know, that I, that I go and run every so often that if I don't, because a lot of times I'm, I'm working either from, from home or, or from uh, another small office that I'll just kind of get in the zone and zone out and like, it'll be a few hours later and I haven't done anything. And so really for me, it's, it's really about, you know, how, how much of the things you kind of take for granted, just like normal everyday activity, you really have to be thoughtful of. Great. And tracking has helped do that for you, obviously, by, by bringing it yeah, enormously. I mean, just looking at it on a day to day basis. But you know, every now and then I go out back and look at aggregate information. So I kind of, I've played around with making um, calendar heat maps to look at kind of my years versus each other, and it's pretty striking to see like how life changes, like mm. um, walking to an office versus working from home, really affect. Right. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Overall activity. Yeah, so it's the things yeah. we don't really think about, which could influence physical activity, for example, and it's just a light, uh, some kind of life change. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, Ernesto, thank you so much for joining us today and to introduce us to The Quantified Self. Um, it's been great. And like I said, we'll put all the, the links to you guys and everything in, in the show notes so people can find you easily and get started, hopefully, uh, in their local towns as well. Yeah, well, this has been fun. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. To get more of The Quantified Body, subscribe on iTunes or go to the website, verquantifiedbody.net. That's T-H-E-Q-U-A-N-T-I-F-I-E-D-B-O-D-Y dot N-E-T. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, we are at twitter.com slash quantifiedbody. And on Facebook, we are at facebook.com forward slash quantifiedbodypodcast. If you've got feedback or requests for the show, you can email them to me at damien at thequantifiedbody.net. That's D-A-M-I-E-N at verquantifiedbody.net. Thanks for joining the show this week. See you next time.